What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Weekly Dose of Dano TV. Here with your host, Dano, bringing you the best content that you're going to find on the internet. If you stay for 10 minutes, you're going to stay for the entire hour because we have Matt Jaskell live here with us in the on Weekly Dose of Dano TV for today. Matt, you are a NASCAR driver, stunt driver, skydiver, and many other things to add to your portfolio. But now you're on Weekly Dose of Dano TV, so you're about to get your next source of adrenaline and, and high emotions right now. So, Matt, what do you have to say to everybody before we get started for today? Well, first, I just want to say thank you for having me on, and I'm already excited, man. I love the energy, and uh, and we have obviously have a mutual friend, uh, you know, somebody that I that is very dear to me. I love her. You know, she's always looked after me, uh, Beatrice, and so she's the one to introduce me to you. And uh, I just want to say thanks to everybody at home and who anybody who's watching this right now. And Hopefully we take you on a fun little journey for the next uh, whatever it's going to be hour or so, and and um, hopefully some of the things I share about my life, very open and open hearted and candid, uh, you know, touches on some people at home watching this, and uh, the people can relate to it, and maybe maybe help them uh, with anything they're going going uh, any struggles they're ha having in life. So awesome, thank you so much, and that's really what we we're, we're always here about. We're here to help people level up in their own personal journeys and just hearing your stories about, you know, adrenaline and living on the edge and, and always having that mental fortitude and whatever it is that you decide to do. We're going to help everybody else achieve that in their daily lives as well. So don't go anywhere because it's time for another episode of Weekly Dose of Dano TV. Let's get it, everybody. I'm super excited to be here with you guys today with Matt Jaskell, giving you guys the keys and the golden nuggets, or I should say gold bars, to make sure that we are living our lives to the fullest and just obliterating whatever obstacle that we might be going through in our lives. And he's the perfect person that just embodies that with his mental fortitude. And, you know, we're going to get to his story. But before we bring on Matt Jaskell, I just want to talk to you guys about a few things. Um, you know, the other day, I don't think I officially released this, but I'm going to release it with you guys right here and I'm going to show you. I actually got on the cover of the Anointed News Journal, which is a uh, publication here in the South Jersey area. And I just wanted to show you what the front cover is looking like. Uh, so, yeah, that's your boy right here. And I'm just super grateful and excited just to talk about, you know, my life story and the show and, and you know, with everything with you guys, because it wouldn't be possible without you guys, my positivity posse. So I just wanted to say, look at what we did. This is the first of many achievements that we have, um, you know, accomplished. And I'm just super, super grateful for each and every one of you from the guests to, like I said, my positivity posse, for everybody to make this happen and just being a part of it because I couldn't have done this without you guys. I mean, imagine if you guys weren't here talking with me live now, I would just be talking to a camera screen, talking to myself, kind of looking like a crazy person, right? Uh, but, you know, I just wanted to say shout out to you guys because this wouldn't be possible without you. And this is just another victory that, that we can add to our repertoire and, and to our list of all the things that we might go through on a daily basis and for the things that we don't really, you know, share in public with other people. So, like I said, I wanted to share that with you guys because this is just, it just, it's a really great feeling. And I want you to understand that this is not going to happen without resistance happening in our lives, because that's something that happens every day in our life. And we really can't see it. We can't, you know, smell it, touch it, taste it, hear it, anything with the five senses. Cause you know, I just feel like there's kind of forces that may be working against us or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, resistance is always going to be something, an obstacle in our lives. So when we make sure that we are doing everything that we can to fight it, whether it's, you know, informing ourselves with reading books or looking at positive media, um, you know, going to the gym or just making sure that we're working on our mindset and our physical set, uh, we are going to do everything that it that it takes in order to live the, the you know, the, our lives and, and 
accomplish our dreams and everything that we want to do. And like I said, this is just another testament of that. And it doesn't matter if you don't have a certain number of followers or it doesn't matter if you grew up in a certain area in the world or all of that stuff. Those are external things. And, you know, when you have that mental fortitude and that positive, you know, personal development, you are literally just working against yourself. So if you are just feeding yourself with the great things and great energy and great pieces of media or whatever it is that you're going to do in the positive sense, there's nothing that can stop you. But on the other hand, if, you know, we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing or, you know, just really getting distracted and getting off of our road or our path of, you know, purpose and, and our destiny, then, yeah, things are going to seem like they're not working out for us. But always understand that everything is always working out for us, no matter how great or even if we don't really see it at the time. If we make that intention and we say that the things are working out for us, even if we can't see it at the time, it will end up working out that way. And everything that happens in our life is meant to happen um, in the positive or negative sense. If, whatever you want to take it as, everything is meant to happen the way that it's happening uh, for us to reach our greatest and, and you know best good. And that will be my affirmation for today for you guys. Um, What's going on, Matt Jasko? Matt, what are you doing? Comments in the back. You're supposed to be on the show. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we're gonna bring Mac. We're gonna bring Matt out in a little bit. And like I said, um, you know, I'm just really grateful for you guys. Thank you so much for being a part of this journey with me. My positivity posse. You guys are the best. Thank you for dropping the hashtag positivity posse. Lou, uh, let's go. Let's go is right. You know what? I I can't make you guys wait any any longer, man. Because Matt's story. It's absolutely incredible and really is the embodiment of what Weekly Dose of Dano is all about when it comes to, you know, working on ourselves and really achieving whatever goals or dreams. It is possible. And I know it sounds cliche, it might sound corny, uh, but I've experienced it. I'm still experiencing it as we speak today because we have other goals and things that we are accomplishing and going for. Um, but Matt, I'm telling you, once you guys hear his, his journey, his story, you guys are going to want to go out there, get into your cars. Hopefully you don't break any speeding laws, but you're going to feel all of the great vibrations that Matt has to bring onto the show. So Matt, you know, without further introduction, it's time to bring Matt Jaskell onto the show. Matt, Matt, what are you doing, Matt? Stop training for your next NASCAR race. It's time to get on the show. Hey, Matt, how you feeling today, man? I'm feeling great, man. I, I got to be honest, genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, it was uh, there was I had I had a little bit of emotions at times listening to you talk because uh, the parallels of of your life and what you're trying to do definitely match with with mine. And and uh, I'm honored to be here, man. I see I already see you. I don't even know you, and I I know uh, I know what you're trying to accomplish, and and I love it, and I appreciate you having me on here. Thank you so much, Matt. And like I said, it, it's it's so interesting how you can be on the other side of the world, literally, right when you were doing castaways. Um, and right now on the other side of the country, because you are in Vegas, but when we all come together just to make sure that we leave this world a little bit better than what we found it, I think that's where we can really, you know, find our purpose in our life. And that is one of the keys to happiness that we're going to get into today. But you have done it in a completely different realm and, you know, a completely different profession, which is, uh, you know, the NASCAR and being a professional driver. And let's talk about that because it's not about me. It's about we, right? It's about us. So I know in your bio, you were talking about, you know, in your early years, you develop a great sense or a great fascination for going fast and speed. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit when it comes to that fascination? Like, did you have an innate feeling just ever since the get go? Like you just always wanted to go fast and find that adrenaline or did you have somebody kind of there to inspire you to go into that field? I mean, I, I would say maybe a little bit of both, you know, great question. Right. I think, uh, of course it always comes down to our, you know, our upbringing, right. In my opinion. And, uh, my father, my father was a boat racer, uh, before I was even born and, and boat racing was one of the most it still is, you know, one of the most dangerous high speed forms of motorsports in the world, you know, and, uh, and we were always, you know, we were just always a little bit different of a family, a little bit of a gearhead family, you know, so, you know, we weren't so traditional, our, our vacations and holidays and, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, you know, whatever it was, we were out at the dunes riding four wheelers and dirt bikes. And, and uh, that was kind of just what we did, because I think my dad came from that you know, he, he was a, a bit of a, you know, fast paced guy. My mother, she not, she wasn't necessarily, but she supported it. You know, she wasn't, uh, she wasn't a gearhead per se, but she loved, you know, being out there and, and, and being a part of it and, and letting us, letting the boys, my brother and I, especially, uh, do our thing. And, 
so I started racing motocross at a, at a young age of only five years old. And, and, uh, I wasn't necessarily an adrenaline junkie. I wasn't, you know, I, I wanted to go fast. You know, there was a funny story. I was going down a hill, at like five years old on a scooter and, and I, I crashed really bad. And I, and my face was all scarred up pretty good. And I, I ran in the house crying and my mom goes, what happened? I was like, I was going light speed, you know, <laughs> reference to, to Star Wars. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I wanted to go fast ever since I was a kid, um, but I didn't know where that would lead until I was about more, until I got older, until about 10, 11 years old. Wow. I love that. And, you know, it's, it's just amazing how even back then, you know, if you were to have like a video camera of your mom, you know, just you going fast, just it's kind of a foreshadow for your life. And I guess you could say that was your purpose even back then. And, you know, it sounds like you've always followed your dreams too, which is a big part of the story. Uh, Cause not a lot of people follow that, you know, they, they think, Oh, well, you know, I got to get a job and I got to do X, Y, Z in order to not really follow my passion. Um, But you, you stuck with it. And I kind of want to talk about, you know, that moment of when you first got into NASCAR and, um, you know, a lot of people, when it comes to the NBA, I was reading a few things online and they say, oh, well, what was your welcome to the NBA moment where they have like somebody dunk on them or somebody cross them over? Matt, can you tell us like, what was that moment that you said, oh shit, excuse my language, oh shit, you know, I'm here in NASCAR and now it's time to perform uh, to, to the best of my ability. God, man, so I, without trying to take too long-winded of an answer, my journey into NASCAR you know, into racing in general, racing is a much different world, you know, and it's not always so pretty either, to be honest, it's not always so, you know, uh, glitz and glamour. I mean, there's a lot of politics involved and uh, motorsports. So I'm being very open hearted and candid, you know, not trying and definitely not being negative per se, you know, like racing is a very um, financial sport. You know, it's one of the fewer sports in the world that unfortunately doesn't always necessarily um, talent doesn't necessarily guarantee you anything. It's an expensive sport. You have to have uh, you have to have funding and money behind you, you know, and I didn't come. My, my family was not rich. They, they weren't even I wouldn't even say they were wealthy. My dad was a hardworking man on his hands and knees, quite literally hardwood floor installer. Um, you know, we we made enough money to go play, you know, to go. But then when it was time for me to start moving my career up in motorsports, if it wasn't for the fact that I got scholarships and I was signed, I was signed to Red Bull as an F1 American development driver way back in 2004. If those things didn't happen in my life, my racing career would have stopped because we didn't have the money that it took to move forward. So, so I know we're sitting here talking about how I'm a NASCAR driver, but that actually happened very, very late in my life, you know? So I'm actually getting, I'm, I'm, getting older in motorsports. I'm in my late thirties, you know? So, I mean, I was pursuing Formula One and was an F1 development driver for Red Bull. And then I raced in IndyCar and I, I, in the Indy light series. And, and so my, my story in motorsports is very, very, it's a very journeyed story, you know, of ups and downs and where racing for me stopped for a long time because of all kinds of reasons, uh, call it financial with the economic collapse way back in 2008 and then family setbacks, you know, father had a heart attack and, uh, took over the family business, you know, that was back in 2015. So it's been a long road. My entry into NASCAR came out of nowhere. And, and it was, I wasn't racing professionally anymore. I was just working in the motorsports arena, you know, doing, a, you know, being a professional racing instructor, which is what a lot of, you know, semi-retired, uh, you know, race car drivers do. If they're not racing a car, they're working in motorsports or, or they're working towards, you know, working in Hollywood, being a stunt driver, because you can make a good living. It, if you can get, get gigs, you know? So, so I was just working in motorsports. I was actually also skydiving and, and, and doing some other stuff. And, and it's actually uh, this company that you see here, auto parts for less.com on, on this, on this NASCAR. This is actually a, the NASCAR truck series, which I raced part-time last year. Um, he was a friend of 20. And, and this is a good, and a good story of why we're sharing this, right. Is because it all ties into never giving up uh, relationships that you create in your life. So this, this, this gentleman, this friend of mine who it, it was like out of a movie, especially if you know anything, even in sport, you know, whether it's football or, or motorsports, especially I was in Florida working a car, working again, I was working as a racing instructor, you know, for a program, teaching young drivers in a series. And, and I get a phone call from, from a friend who I've known for more than 20 years. And I met him at a go-kart track when I was 15, 16 years old, working at a go-kart track as a racing instructor, working my way up in the ranks of motorsports. And he was just a pal. He was just a friend and a Vegas friend. 
and we've stayed in touch for 20 years and we've been pals. And then he created auto parts for less.com and he had, he had made it essentially. And he's still struggling to, you know, he's still pushing hard and, and trying to create his business. He's a publicly traded entity and he's trying to grow the company. He competes directly with companies like eBay motors and things like that. But I get a phone call out of the blue in 2021. So it's still kind of like pandemic times. It was like February. And he literally says this, he goes, Hey Matt, I've always believed in you. I've always thought you're one of the best drivers out there. And uh, I, I, I've, I've always wanted to be in NASCAR as a, as, a, as a title sponsor on a race car. And I want you to race for me. And, and, and that's kind of how it happened. And, and I had not been in a professional car in 10 years. You can't just go show up to NASCAR and, and be a driver. You, know, you, you have to either have lineage or be approved to race. You know? So it was a long journey. It was us calling NASCAR and explaining my story. Luckily, I, you know, I have... Uh, you know, a good pedigree of being a, a, you know, a professional motorsports driver. And so they, they allowed me to enter a race um, where you had to still prove yourself. So the way NASCAR works is they go, okay, we'll let you race, but it has to be on a, a smaller track. So it's not as fast. It's on a half mile. You can't just go straight to Daytona at 200 miles an hour. You know, you have to do one of the smaller tracks. And as long as you do okay there and you don't crash anybody, you don't look like an idiot. Um, then they'll let you go to the next track and then the next track and then until they sign you off and you're cleared to race. I mean, it's not so it's not just as easy as like, oh, I'm, I'm going to race in NASCAR now. Um, and what it made it even crazier for us is it was kind of very crazy times. It was still COVID and NASCAR was doing these COVID rules where there was no qualifying and there was no practice. So that's insane. What? It's kind of insane to think. I had not raced a car on a professional level in almost a decade. And NASCAR said, all right, kid, we'll let you show up and go race. Don't screw this up. And I had to show up and get in a NASCAR that I had never touched, no practice, no qualifying, and take the green flag and not screw it up. And wow. And I did. And I went out there with 40 other cars on, on a famous racetrack, one of the oldest NASCAR tracks in, in, in history. It's called Martinsville in Virginia. It's a half mile famous track. And I started the race in 40th because there was no qualifying. I had to start dead last. And I, thought, <laughs> and I, I, I worked up to a, like a 20th place finish, which was a, a big deal for a low budget team. And then, and then the rest is kind of history. Then I went and continued on. And all the races I did in 2021 – um, were no practice, no qualifying. You just got to figure it out, go hit, you know, hit the gas and hope you don't crash, you know? And that's, and yeah, it was a wild journey, man. And, and even on the first race, it was kind of, I mean, my, I was, I was more nervous than I could honestly explain. I genuinely was as much as I'm a professional. Yeah. It's what I've devoted my entire life to. I was freaking terrified, man. And not terrified of like getting hurt or anything like that. You're terrified of screwing up and, and maybe not pulling it off, you know? Yeah. And so so it was wild to say the least. And, I bet. Uh, and, you know, Lou says it right here. Talk about pressure where you've kind of, you know, worked up your entire life to get to this moment. You yeah. know, it sounds like something out of a movie. I haven't done it for, you know, 10 years. And now I'm just going to go straight to the big leagues. Well, you know, for then, you know, without having any practice and not having a real, you know, super great team or maybe a super, you know, a lot of budget to it. Because, yeah. you know, it's just something about just that pressure, I bet. But, you know, you work through it and, and you just were able to fight through it. And now here we are talking about the entire experience. Um, yeah. And Matt, you know, I, I love the stories, but now we actually got to take a quick commercial break just to hear a word from our first sponsor. But no we are going to continue more about this NASCAR talk because we have, you know, it's not always rainbows and sunshines and butterflies. And Matt, I know there was a, a, a something that happened to you back in 2021 um, that wasn't something that you can maybe foresee coming and we're going to talk about how you bounce back from that you know incident or thing that happened because i don't want to give it away just yet everybody just stick around and we'll tell you exactly what happened after a word from our sponsors so everybody like share do whatever do whatever you have to do to raise your vibrations because we're going to hear after uh we're going to hear from our first sponsor let's get it everybody <laughs>
That was our first sponsor, It Takes a Village Housing. Thank you for sponsoring Weekly Dose of Dano TV to make this possible. And go visit ittakesavillage1.org if you want to learn more information about how they're helping women and children in the South Jersey area. So thank you. Big shout out to them as well. Uh, Matt, when it comes to things that we can't foresee and, it, you know, time to really accomplish our dreams and to really find our purpose in our life, it's not always rainbows and sunshines and butterflies. And we'll be the first ones here to tell everybody watching, hey, there are going to be things that come up that we can't foresee coming. So I want to play one clip that I found online. And I kind of want to I want you to talk about how you bounce back from this, you know, mishap or kind of maybe a setback or obstacle, whatever you want to call it. Um, just please let us know what's going on in this clip. OK. And, uh, you know, I, I think you know you're going to play. Right. <laughs> I may be. But, uh, here it is. Uh, let me just go back right here. Oh, cool. And that sign from the driver to safety officials that they are okay pretty wild sequence of events there brad i mean the cars don't look like they have huge damage from certain areas like no big hard hits but it seemed like the wreck just kept going and going so and this uh yeah, I, I and this car you're number 13 off turn correct? Two and you could see i'm the number 13 yeah here yeah here we go line so there goes jesse little spinning Josh Williams spins to the outside, and then here comes Jaskell in the 13, and just so much momentum gets him up on top of the 78. Dude, what is yeah. what am I seeing right now? I see your car on top of another car with all this smoke going on. Um, talk about you know what happened because obviously you know it, it was a crash, I guess you can call it. Um, but what was the road to recovery like? Was there any like? you know, things that you had to bounce back from after this incident? No, I mean, luckily, man, this was actually a pretty wild crash. You know, I mean, it's so much tamer than some of the other ones that you'll see out there. Sometimes I mean, there was a couple in my in my category. Right. So so for those that don't know NASCAR, there's there's only three professional levels of NASCAR. There's the NASCAR Cup Series, which is the, t the top, which runs on Sundays all the biggest names you've ever heard of like Kurt you know Kyle Busch stuff like that and then Saturday traditionally is the uh, the Xfinity series which was formerly known as the famously known as the Bush series back in the good old days and um, that runs on Saturdays where a lot of the same big name drivers that you know they'll run on Saturday as well the car is very identical or very very similar and and you know similar speeds and everything and um and then uh, the the NASCAR truck series traditionally on Friday so this so I've been I was racing in the NASCAR Xfinity series on Saturdays you know, we're doing speeds of, you know, uh, you know, no slower than 150 and up, up, upwards of pushing close to, you know, 190 miles an hour on some of the bigger tracks. And, uh, and so this was an interesting situation. So this is a, one of the gnarliest, coolest, you know, famous tracks. It's actually called the monster mile. Uh, it's in Dover, Delaware. And, uh, and as you can see, it's a monster. I mean, it's a super fast track. I mean, we're doing about like 175 miles an hour and, um, and once again, so luckily this wasn't my fault, you know, so I would, there was an interview that I did and I was, I was very upset because the car got damaged, you know, and, and, and luckily the race team that I raced for, we, you know, my sponsor wasn't, wasn't responsible for crash damage, which a lot of times drivers sponsorship, you know, there was probably over $10,000 in crash damage in that situation. Uh, the car that I landed on top of, it destroyed that car because the weight of my car crushed the roll cage, making the car worthless. That was probably a hundred thousand dollar loss for that team. Um, I mean, yeah, we're not. I mean, these are big budgets, man. It's not a. It's it's wild out there. And so I got hit from behind, and that's what spun me around and then put me over. And and I gotta say, as I was going backwards, and, and it's not a movie I necessarily love, but I've grown to love it. Is Talladega? You know, everybody always cites Talladega Nights, and it's hilarious. And I was, I was like, I'm going backwards. It's not good. It's not good. And then I and then I'm going through the air, and I was like, this is not good. Um, so what's again, as a driver, what, what gets, I, I wasn't hurt. I was not injured whatsoever. I mean, the cars are pretty amazing. It was a very, I mean, if you see, if you show the video again, there's another angle where the you know back of the car is like 15 feet in the air. And so I got very lucky that it, that it wasn't, uh, that it wasn't more painful or more damage or anything. And I, I bounced back from it just fine. But, but it was one of those situations where that was only my third NASCAR race ever. And I was having a good race, a good run. And, and we get hit, we get hit from behind from somebody that you know that, that so there's a crash that happens in front of us as you see i slow down as i should and i i slow down here's the yeah you know, here's the hit and then it was a pretty good boom you know i mean luckily i hit backwards felt it a little bit in my back but it wasn't too bad and um 
but yeah, it was it was the cause of somebody else driving into the back of us that that spun us around. And so again, remember I talked about NASCAR has a a, a system where they approve you to go to the next race. So so I did a half mile. And then I went to, to Darlington, which is actually one of the most difficult NASCAR tracks in history. And I did very well there. But then Dover was kind of like, I got thrown into it, wasn't sure I was going to be doing it. One, again, no practice. It was, I, I mean, one of the most difficult tracks in NASCAR. And you got to understand, like, you, there's 40 cars on the track. And there's, and when, if you understand racing, there's dirty air. So the car like moves around and doesn't have downforce sometimes. And, and I had to go straight to the green flag. You're full throttle by lap two, hitting 170 plus miles an hour. And you're just like, I don't know how the car is going to handle what's going to happen. And so when I crashed, I was more upset that NASCAR was going to be like, well, you know, do we approve him to the next race? And luckily NASCAR looks at everything and all the footage and like, okay, he was doing a good job. This wasn't his fault. He got hit from behind. No harm, no foul. Let's let him go to the next race. And, wow. and, and luckily we had sponsorship. The car, the damage wasn't too bad. Like for, for as bad as it looks, the damage wasn't too bad. And, and there's multiple cars. You know, a NASCAR team has even a low budget team is they have to have like four or five different cars. Cause you actually, you use a different car for different style tracks. You have a road course car, a short track car, a mid track car, a mile and a half car, a super speedway car. I mean, there's more involved. NASCAR is far more complex than ever, anybody would really understand if they're not involved in motorsports. And yeah. so again, luckily we were able to go on to the next race and, and I had a, a solid, a solid partial season, as you would say, since I was racing part-time. Of course, man. And, you know, thank God that you're okay, that you were able to continue everything that you have going on, because there's things that you don't even know, you know, that we still have coming about in our lives. And thank God, like I said, that you are okay to make sure yeah. that you are achieve, able to achieve all those great things. And I know one of the things that we're going to be talking about in the next segment is going to be the Castaways, um, you know, series that you've done where you went to, uh, you know, remote island for about 40, was it 41 days or 42 days? 42. 42 days by yourself. And I, just to give you guys a little bit of information about that, you know, Castaways is, you know, you go in by yourself on a remote island and you have the opportunity that you're close enough with the next person next to you to say, hey, well, let's work together to, you know, make it through the day or you can or make it through the entire 42 days. Or you can just say, you know what, I'm going to do this by myself. And Matt actually had the chance to go do that. Um, so stick around and we're going to be talking about that in the next segment. But I want to talk about what you just mentioned, and it was driving speeds up to 175 miles an hour. Um, when you're going that fast, does that seem like you're, do you seem like you're in flow at that time where everything is just, you know, peaceful and you're just accustomed to that? And that's where, you know, you feel that you need to be or what's, can you describe the, the, the feelings going 175 miles an hour? I love what you said, flow. Yes, you are in like a flow state, but it is certainly not calm by any means right if yeah you were, so i'll tell you this so like vegas i have got to race my hometown race twice uh three times i did two xfinity races uh 2021 2022 and then i raced uh the nascar truck as well and those speeds are about 108 let's say 185 190 miles an hour in the draft like top speed you're, you're cruising you're cruising around 185 miles an hour cruising and it, and, yeah cruising and yeah uh -huh. and again there, there's so much to it there's there's uh there's other cars on track, 40 of them. There's dirty air, there's track conditions, there's crashes happening, there's tire degradation. So as you're driving, the tires are getting worse and worse and worse. So the car might start to slide around and start to act different and start to uh, you know, the the you know might not turn as well, might get loose. I mean, there's things are changing. So you do get into a flow state where you're just kind of in a rhythm, you're in the zone, but things are constantly happening and changing. And, and I wish I had footage to show you the crashes that have happened in front of me at 185 miles an hour. And it's hard. It's, it's, and I've even learned a lot racing in NASCAR where I'll watch stuff on TV, even as a racing driver. And, and I might criticize a driver and say, oh, you know, he made a mistake, but you know what? You don't understand how fast things are happening. I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's very cool. Like when you're in a corner and there's, you know, 20 other, you're in the middle of the pack. There's 20 cars behind you. There's 20 cars in front of you. You're all doing 185 miles an hour. Everything is like moving so quick that your eyes can barely, you know, see. And, and when something happens, you might not even have time to react. You might even get, you know, you might get praised for saving it. And you're like, I got lucky. Shit. I got lucky in that situation. I was just, I was just moving in the right place at the right time. And then sometimes there is a lot of talent involved and sometimes you run out of talent and maybe you get caught up in a crash, you know? Um, but yeah, if you're by yourself, that is kind of a beautiful thing. If you're by yourself, 
doing a qualifying run or something like that, you are kind of in this flow state where things are just clicking along and, 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 and your body and your mind get used to it. Right. So this maybe on lap one, you're like, Whoa, things are fast. And then, and then your body adjusts. Right. So like on the first, like the first time I raced a NASCAR truck series, it was at, um, one of my first races was in a track at Atlanta and Atlanta's called a super speedway now. Cause they've changed the track. It's flat out full throttle, about 190 miles an hour. And you're just holding the throttle flat out. And, and again, things are just moving so quick. And in the first couple laps, you're just like, Oh my God. And then after five laps, you're kind of like, yes, let's go. You know, you're just kind of in it and you're enjoying it and, and, and you're, you're settling in and everything. But, um, but yeah, so there's, you're definitely not comfortable per se, but, uh, but, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It's hard to explain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I bet. And you know, just the passion and the smiles and the way that you're talking about it, you can tell that you were born for this and that <laughs> you've been doing this ever since you were a little kid um, as well. But like I said, I'm just really grateful and everybody in the positivity posse is grateful that you made it through. Um, you got to learn the experience and you were still able to, you know, keep going forward and, and really achieving going along with your dreams and your goals as well. Uh, we actually have two questions that we're going to get to later about it. So I'm going to star them, but we're going to get back to Matt's, you know, NASCAR career, but we got to hear one more. Well, we have to hear another, a word from our sponsor again. So we're going to play another commercial and remember everybody like share and keep the high positive vibrations going. Cause you can just hear it in Matt's voice. So we're going to be talking about castaways. If you want in this next minute, do your research, do your homework. Um, because we're going to be back after one minute after word from our sponsors. to our second sponsor for sponsor weekly dose of down tv the elks lodge in the south jersey area as well thank you so god thank you so much guys for making this possible because it wouldn't be possible without you guys and special shout out to my positivity posse as well so matt now we're going to talk about some this i think this is going to be the most interesting part of everything i mean i know it's i guess that's subjective right because you know somebody could say nascar is interesting or you know the future projects that we're going to be talking about later that you have coming up are interesting but i'm really curious about this because i've always seen you know discovery channel where it's like naked and afraid or man versus wild but in this case it's your show with castaways on abc and i always thought that you know maybe with a a, a a little bit more knowledge i could always survive you know in the wild by myself in a remote island but you're gonna say you're gonna tell us you know if that's really true or you know if if most people can do it if they can't but well, we're gonna get to that so matt tell us a little bit about your experience and the background of what castaways is and how you got involved or why you wanted to get involved with the show Okay, so we have like six more hours, so I can, <laughs> so, I can get it. so I'll do the best I can to to make a very very long story long, as as a good friend of mine always says, and and so but jokingly I'll I'll make it as short as possible. But so you got to understand, like, so my NASCAR journey that didn't start until 2021, and Castaways goes back to 2017 uh, when I first got the phone call. That's you know you know it's five years ago now, and um, how it kind of came about was again you know life had taken a dramatic turn, you know, so I was working as a professional racing instructor and, uh, and, and, you know, constantly doing what a lot of racing drivers do, which is just grind and try to find sponsorship and hopefully go racing professionally. And, and it just wasn't very realistic for me, you know, because of, of some family setbacks and, and choices that I made. Um, uh, my father had a heart attack and uh, opened by uh, open heart surgery, triple bypass survived. And, um, and I was, Again, I was working as the chief instructor of a racing school in Vegas, and I wasn't happy. I, I genuinely was not happy. Uh, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go as far as saying I was depressed, but I just I wasn't happy with life. It wasn't where I wanted to be. You know, and and 
And as much as people saw like, oh, you're working at a racetrack and race cars, exotic cars must be so cool. I was grateful that I had a, a good, cool, you know, unique job. But how something, um, how I always related it to people is like, imagine you're a baseball player and you're a solid, you're a, so, you're a badass, you're a good, you can throw a hundred mile an hour fastball. You could be on any, any major league team and hold your own, but, but you can't, but there's no spot. You can't get it. You can't get a. You can't get a, a, a you know, get a contract. And um, imagine you're working at a batting cage. Do you think that guy would be happy? Of course not. It's not what you devoted your life to do. You know, it's like, no. I, and I, and that's kind of what I equated it to. You know, it was like, it's not where I wanted to be. I didn't want to be sitting, you know, on a bench, you know, or, or at, you know, at the, at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway, you know, working at a driving experience. Again, I was grateful for the job, but it's not, it wasn't what I wanted to be doing with my life. And um, so I was already kind of like not not really happy. And, and I, and, you know, racing was looking, the window was slowly closing. It didn't look like being in a professional race car was going to be, was going to be realistic. And, uh, and then my dad has a heart attack. My father has a heart attack and I, uh, he had a, a small wood business that supported him and supported my mother and even supported me at times, you know, like, you know, my, my family is the reason I even have a roof over my head. You know, it's, it, you know, it's, let's be real, right. It's not, it's not like I made a million dollars in motorsports and bought my own home. It, it's because of family and life and journey. And, and we've all, you know, helped each, you know, my family has worked together to, to have the, the, the little that we have, you know? And so when my father had the heart attack, I quit my job. I quit all of motorsports and I took over a wood business, you know, that was failing. It was going to go bankrupt without him. And, uh, wow. and so I, so I dove right in and that was a pretty wild journey. And, and that was like 2016 into 2017 running this, uh, this wood business that I knew nothing about. And, and, and slowly, and I was proud. I was, I was, I was doing what I thought was the right thing to do, you know, was to help my father and my family who gave me an amazing life. And now they were having a hard time. And, and I, so I stepped in like anybody, like I thought anybody should do. And it was actually hurt. It honestly hurt sometimes. People would say, "Oh man, it's so amazing you did that." And I genuinely was like, "Isn't that what you're? Isn't this what you do? You know? I mean, yeah. I, you know, parents... well, that's because of your upbringing, that's why you thought that. But somebody else would be like, you know, I'm just gonna go do what's best for me and not, you know. Uh, yeah, not... it, it was actually kind of sad to hear other people say, "Man, some people might say, sorry, pop, sorry, I, I'm, I have a biz, I'm, I have my own thing going on. I can't help you, you know." Yeah. So I'm, I'm grateful that I was in a life situation where. Yeah, I was making good money. I was I was living a, a decent life, and I, again, I wasn't necessarily happy. wasn't doing exactly what I wanted, but I was doing all right. And uh, I had started skydiving, which is a whole other story we, that we can try to touch on. But so, anyways, I take over the family business. I, I'm out of motorsports. I'm not really doing much. And um, and then I get a phone call from a friend uh, through motorsports, of course. And he goes, "Hey, you know my my daughter in law is casting for a big TV show, and and she wants to, I, you know, she asked if I knew anybody interesting, and so I recommended you." And I was dealing with a lot. I was taking care of my my mother, my father, uh, even helping my my older brother. I, I I was not in a good situation in life, you know. I things were pretty wild, and um, and and I said, listen, I don't have time for this. You know, I'm not interested. And it's not that you know, castaways <laughs> is nothing I applied for, you know. And so so I, I she, he said, will you please just talk to her and and humor her for a minute? Okay, fine, I'll I'll go talk to her. So I get on the phone with her, and she goes. Okay, I can't tell you what network. It was all very cryptic, you know. She's like, I can't tell you what network. I can't really explain it, you know. Blah blah blah. It's you know, it's going to be the greatest thing in your life. It could change your life, and you get to tell your life story. And but, but it involves surviving on a deserted jungle island for up to two months without food or shelter. And no, I, you, you <laughs> said sign me up. I bet, right? No, man, I did not. I said you got the wrong guy. Okay, I'm a. <laughs> I'm a city race. I'm a city boy, race car driver. You know, like I got a pedicure once because I was, you know, I, I was taking care of myself one day. Like I was like, no, you got the wrong guy. I have no desire to go starve in a jungle. As much as I'm adventurous, I was like, yo, I'm not. That's not what I'm. That's, I can't do that. And and then she goes, I think. And then of course, again, make a very long story short. You know, they were kind of like, well, we think you can, and you should consider this. And um, one thing led to another, and I said yes. And, and I said yes, mostly because I went to my parents as well. I went to my family and I said, listen, I got, I got a, a weird offer. And by then I knew that it was ABC and it was like created by the same guy that created Alone on History Channel and that it wasn't going to be a competition or a game show. It was going to be more like a documentary and social experiment. Okay. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and so I went to my family and I said, listen, uh, I got this offer to go do this you know, what do you think? And at the, you got to understand at the time I'm taking care of the family. I'm taking care of my mother, my father, I'm running the business, you know, leaving for two months could be detrimental, you know? And they said, and they looked at me and they said, we think you should do this. 
and I was kind of like, oh, oh shit. I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to go in the beginning, I, right? I, and yeah. I genuinely was looking for an excuse. I, I was looking for a, an excuse to not go and, and looking to say, oh, my parents, you know, I got to take care of them, so I can't do it. And, and then when they looked at me and said, we don't want to hold you back. We think you should do this. I was like, oh, okay, shit. I got to go do this. So I did it. And, um, and at first I said, you know, I just want to go see what it's like. I do want to go, you know, get dropped in a jungle and see how I would behave. What would I do? How would I feel? And, and, you know, maybe I'll just stay for a couple of weeks. And, um, and, and, you know, again, it's a very long story of how and why. And I learned the difference between having a how and having a why. You know, and it and, was, it, yeah. And, you know, I, I want to talk about something that you just said, not trying to cut you off, but, you know, there's so much that we have to cover in this, yeah. this story. Um, you know, as, as you just mentioned earlier, you just said literally you went out there to go starve. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this picture and how it, how it makes you feel when you actually see this picture right now? Yeah, no, man. I mean, I, I get emotional even to this day, you know, no, nobody will ever truly. And that was such a, um, such a real photo, man. Like we had just gotten rescued, uh, hours, maybe five, six hours earlier. I had already been eating for a couple hours. I mean, God, man, look at that. You know, I was, I had lost 32 pounds. The, the, the stare, the long stare that you see, it was actually, um, a purple heart, uh, Vietnam vet who was a dear friend and mentor of mine in motorsports, funny enough, who passed away a few years ago. And luckily he was around when I came home and, and this guy, he was a, a purple heart man. This guy got shot in Vietnam. Was a, a wild, wild, uh, you know, genius man. And uh, he called me after he saw this photo, and he goes, "You had the long stare, man. You went through some shit out there, didn't you?" <laughs> and that was from a vet, which was so cool, you know, because I didn't think I did anything noble. I didn't think I did anything noble. And he was like, "No, what you did was pretty amazing. Be proud of yourself." So if you see the mirror, there's a mirror behind me. All right. And so mm -hmm. funny thing about living in a jungle for 42 days, I had no idea what I looked like. And even when they rescued us and put us on this boat and fed us, that mirror was the first time I had seen myself in 42 days. And I, and I like touched my face, I touched my collarbones. And, and it was the first time we were allowed to have our, it was first time I'd seen a cell phone in 42 days. And, and that was kind of weird. I looked at my phone and I even said, uh, like I had a panic attack. So I was like, this isn't my phone. And, she, and the woman that gave it to me was like, what are you talking about? And I, was, and I, I actually kind of like freaked out because I didn't recognize my phone. I had not seen a cell phone in 42 days. And, and when I looked at it, I didn't think it was mine. And the, the, the apps looked weird. I just hadn't seen a cell phone in 42 days. And so, so we, we weren't allowed to make calls or anything, but we were allowed to have our phone so we could like document, take some photos. They actually encouraged us to do like some video journals. And so anyways, I hollered at one of the other guys that survived who was right next to me. And, and the, we, we were like rescued and got to like uh, be in these little huts to like recover. And I go, hey man, will you, will you, come, will you come here really quick? And he, and I turned around and looked at him and that was, and I was just staring at him and he looks at me, he goes crazy, huh? And I went, yeah, will you take a photo? And that was that face, that face that you see was just me in shock, you know? And yeah, and the thousand yard stare, right? Is what the they call it. Yeah. Yeah. It was that yeah. thousand yard stare of just like, man, I had just gone through a pretty wild experience and I went through starvation and, and, and more than that, I went through a, a mental transformation that, that I would never fully be able to explain in, in, in even a couple hours, you know, it's like, I've explained the story a few times, but but I definitely learned the difference between having a why versus a how, you know, and and um, and it's talked about in in a book called Man's Search for Meaning, which is a, a Victor Frankel, who is a survivor from the Holocaust, and and he talks about like those who had a how didn't survive um, because you have to have a why bigger than a how. You have to have a why are you going to survive? Why why are you going to go through this? And and that was kind of what I learned th during the journey. Twenty five days in, I was ready to quit. I didn't think I could do it. I, I didn't. I I was starving. I didn't want to stay. And um and and through that journey, I found a why bigger than a how. And um and that's what made me stay for the forty two days. And yes, I was alone for eight days. There was to give people kind of the backdrop who've never seen it. I've told the story a million times, but um there was uh the, the show's never been done again it was a one-time deal it, and it was beautiful it was amazing uh but it was also you know never been done before people didn't really quite understand it and it was a documentary about it was it was a social experiment to to document human change and what will people go through um when they're pull, when they're they're literally stripped away from the world in a very abrupt manner we were essentially like taken from our homes thrown in a jungle cut off from the world how are you going to react? You know? And, and so it wasn't so much about, so you don't even see half the stuff I did to survive, you know, you know, we're spearing stingray and, you know, catching fish. You don't see most of that stuff because it wasn't about survival. It was about human transformation, the mental aspect, the emotional side of things. 
And um, and that yeah, and it was. We might have to do a part two on that because, like you said, I mean, just the the amount of questions that I do have. I mean, we're we're not going to be able to get to them. Uh, but yeah. I think the most, I guess, one of the biggest questions that I have for you in that situation is, uh, would you do it again? I would. I wish I could, man. I, I it was the greatest, most emotional, most special experience in my life that I still have so much gratitude for today. I get emotional about it because nobody will ever fully understand what it was like to to be cut off from the world, starving in a jungle, going through some pretty intense emotions, you know, from finding some of the wrong people, finding a couple of guys that weren't necessarily the right guys to survive with, and then finding the right people, and then going back to the wrong guys, and you would have to just watch the show, and it would take me, it would take me about 20, 30 minutes to explain why I went back to the other guys, and then went back once again. And by the by, the way, back and forth was a mile and a half of water that I swam four different times. I, I swam across Ooh. a mile and a half of water on day 18, found two human beings. I went back to the original guys across that same mile and a half of water on day 22. And then on day, so I did it, sorry, did it three times. And then on day 35 or 33, I swam back across that mile and a half of water and survived with these other two people until the, until we were rescued. And you didn't know when rescue day was, you, you, you hoped it wouldn't be two months, but you knew it could be up to two months and it ended up being six weeks. And, um, and yeah, man, there's just so, there's so much to it. Right. And, and again, I, I still to this day, I, there's not almost there's almost not a day that goes by that I don't think about it. And and I was a better human being, obviously, when I came home. And and the struggle that I have, the, the thing that actually upsets me the most is is losing that feeling that I had coming home and the the person that I was, and and falling back into maybe the the person that I don't like as much, just you know because of everyday life and struggles and 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 cell phones and you know everything we and the distractions we have in life. But I'm so grateful that I have the tools from that experience to constantly check myself and try to be that person and, and, and constantly remind myself of the, the teachings and the lessons that I had from that experience to continue that forward, if that makes sense. you know. Yeah, of course. And you know, I, I want to talk about the things that you just mentioned, which was contrast, where you needed to experience those people that you didn't want to work with or that you couldn't survive with. And that's when you had that gratitude. And now when those people that you could survive with, that's when you start to say, okay, well, I needed that to happen so that I can feel what, what good is. You know, how can you know what good is if you don't have bad and how can you have up if you don't have down and those kind of things. So, and everybody that's, that's watching right now, these things that are happening in your life, even if you may consider them bad or whatever value you want to establish or assign it to, these things need to happen so that when we do go through our lives and the good things do start to happen to us, uh, you know, we can be that much more grateful of everything that we do. And you just said it right now with cell phones, right? You, you, when you went to go over there, you probably had that primal feeling and you want to get back to it. But then at the same token, what you just said and all of your stories that you mentioned, this cell phone was the reason that you were able to have all of these things. Because in every one of them, you said a friend called me up, a friend called me up. So, you know, when it comes to that cell phones, man, I just love to hear that you kind of had that gratitude. And I love that you bring that up. Like, I, I actually get very upset when people complain about social media. You know, it's like, yes, it is a it is a tool. And if you don't use that tool correctly, it won't benefit your life. And, and you're, yes, there's a lot, especially we are living. I think everybody would agree that we're living in some of the some of the most wild times in in at least in the last hundred years. I would probably, you know, I wasn't around a hundred years ago that I know of, but um, you know, it, it, but knowing the history and stories and, 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 you know, it's like, man, we're living some, through some pretty crazy times, but you know, if you use these things around us that we have for the positive, for the right reasons, they bring you good things, you know, and I got to say, social media has never done anything but really good for me, connecting me with amazing human beings and, 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 and allowing me to share stories and, and see other people's stories. And so I use it in a positive, ma in a positive manner. And if it wasn't for social media, I would never have known about castaways. If I was one of those people like, oh, I stay off social media. It is, it, Everything in life is a balance. I, you know, I got off the phone with one, one of my best friends today who was struggling, who was going through a hard time. And, and I kind of explained these things to, to him as well. I said, you can't always be on the positive swing of the universe. You know, things are going to be bad. And, but as long as you're willing to embrace that and just maintain of like, you know, you, you, you embrace it, it again. And it is cliche, some of these things we say, because, say, you know, saying and applying are, are very different things, right? But oh, yeah, 100%. It, is, it is so true that 
you know, when you're going through those hard times, you just have to kind of smile, which I do. I try to do. And, and, and I will be upset. I get irritated, but I usually say, you know, it, there's going to be a good swing to this and, and you just push through, I guess. And what kind of keeps me going in life, people always say, Oh, you're so positive. It's, it's not even that as much as that. I, I actually just, I, I maintain discipline. I maintain forward movement, you know, no matter how bad things are, you, you, you know, you have to keep going. I, I, I ended up saying this amazing quote, you know, during the show and I, and I didn't mean to say it. It just came out. It genuinely came off the top of my head. I was like, when people ask me, why did you swim across that water and risk, either, risk literally dying? I mean, you know, the production wasn't going to let you die, but they kind of just let you do whatever. And, and yeah. there were sharks in the water. There's, you know, I was, I was starving. And mm -hmm. I said, well, I was going to die wherever I was sitting. So I might as well die trying. So I, I actually still use that quote to people when they're going through a hard time and they're depressed and they're just kind of sitting around. I'm like, you're going to die where you're sitting. So why the hell not just go move forward, yeah. do whatever I love it that. is. Even if you're having a hard time, even if you're depressed, even if you're struggling, you're going to fucking die where you're sitting. So, so die moving forward and trying, you know, and guess what? Nice. You're probably not going to die and you're, and you're going to, and you're going to be like, oh, wow. I, I thought that was my limit back there. And I moved, I crossed that line and I'm doing okay. You know, man, when I tell you all this stuff that you just said is what I embody and what I, what I live literally every day. Do you have like a street fighter on with your hair combed to the side <laughs> and dad was your name? Because literally yeah. I say that all the time. I mean, think about another, a, a classic example of somebody being in a job that they don't want to be at. Right. Uh, when you constantly delay leaving that job and actually following your dreams and your passions, that time is going to pass whether you stay there or if you don't. And it's like you said, you're going to die or if you're sitting there or moving that st same amount of time of taking that 10 years to build and learn and uh, learn a new skill or anything that you want to do. If you take that same 10 years, it's going to be the same as if you don't and stay at that job that you're at or that dead end job or that relationships you don't want to be in or whatever it is that you're in, that same amount of time is going to pass. So might as well spend it doing what something that you actually love and something that you're actually trying to build towards. And I say that all the time. And when I tell you that I, there was a video that I was watching earlier about you and it was just talking about you were scared to come back. Um, it was a little bit of a video series. And I was going to ask you, you know, what those things that you were scared about, you just answered that question for me. Uh, I actually had the clip pulled up. So, I, I mean, we, we're technically supposed to go to 956, but we're going to go over a few minutes because this is just, I need to share this with you guys. Um, and, and let me see if I, if this is right here. Uh, so this was a little bit of a video series of a video journey that you did uh, going oh, back. Wow. So let me see if yeah. this is, uh, if this is it. In a normal life. So, um, I know Vegas has changed. Oh, here it is. Here it is. I got five it. Five flights back to the United States. Uh, again, where I said, I'm a little bit nervous about getting back into normal life. So. So you said you're nervous about getting back to your normal life, right? And one of the things that you just said in the end of what you just said was, you know, a, a lot of people were scared and they make up these things in their mind. But when they go about in real life, that those things that they were ever worried about never really fully happened or it wasn't as bad as what they told themselves it was going to be. And those, like I said, the, everything that I have written down is what you really touched on. And what did I tell you guys? Matt was going to come on here to drop his golden nuggets, his gold bars. Um, and I really love your attitude and I'm really in the same alignment with you, man. And I, for everybody watching, I, like you, like we said earlier, it is a little bit cliche, but all the stuff that we are talking about is true because we live it every day and now we can never go back and, and life is just that much amazing and, and absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah. so Matt, uh, can you tell us, we only have a few minutes left, but can you tell us about maybe any future projects that you have coming up or what we can keep an eye out for Matt Jaskell? Yeah, man. So so I am a professional skydiver and, and I've been focusing some time. Unfortunately, I'm not racing right now. And, and again, that goes back to nothing other than funding. It just goes back to sponsorship. Uh, you know, my friend, Auto Parts for Less, he's still one of my best friends. He's an amazing, you know, and, and, and some of the other supporters of mine, they just don't have the budget to just, just to share since people probably ask. The budget to race one race in NASCAR with a low budget team is a minimum of around $35,000 per race. It's crazy. Wow. I mean, it, racing is so expensive and it's hard to put together the partnerships and the sponsorship deals that, that allow you to race. And, and, and it is hard when you also need to be on the road making a living. So I travel for work. I work 
I work for different car manufacturers, essentially as like a pro driver, you know. So I work for every. I'm going to Indianapolis uh, in a few days to work for BMW in the at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and and these are how you make a living. I was skydiving today. I did eight tandem jumps today. You know, taking people tandem. Uh, so that's a, like a side job of mine, and I'm and I'm doing it to build hours and be a you know be a better tandem instructor because it's it's fairly new to me. Even though I've been skydiving for nearly ten years now, I have about thirty five hundred skydives. Uh, last year I got my SAG card for those who know that the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, terribly, there's a strike right now, so there's no work, but I'm doing more stunt driving. Like I got to work on a Mark Wahlberg movie and, and a Mel Gibson movie at the beginning of the year. And, and I'm, I'm trying to do more stunt driving because I, I want to, I want to do what I'm good at, you know, and I'm not good at a lot of things, but I'm, I am good at behind a wheel and I want to, I want to get paid for what I'm good at, you know? And so, and so I, I'm doing, I'm focusing a little bit more on that, but I, I'm never giving up on racing as far as much as it's just not. I hate saying it's not super realistic to be in a race car at the moment. I'm still trying. I'm working with partners and sponsors to try to be in a race car at least possibly in October here at my hometown race, which is right around my birthday. I've done it the last two years. And so even if it's just one race a year, just to stay out there, stay relevant and, and be in a car and, and also do what I love. So, so I will be trying to race. Um, there's also, uh, obviously there's potential for me to be back in a race car more full time next year as we're working on things. Uh, but that's about it. There's nothing, you know, nothing super, super exciting on, on the, um, on the horizon other than just a uh, little bit of skydiving, hopefully get back to doing some more movie production work when the strike ends and hopefully back in a race car, uh, be, you know, by the end of the year. And one thing I'd like to share to touch on really fast before we end about, you know, just, there's so many little things I could share about that experience I went through. And like I said, maybe there's a part two, but and just to echo what you said, one of the one of the big lessons I learned is that when you are in the wrong situation, whether it's financial, professional, you know, emotional, uh, intimate relationship, whatever your situation is, if you're not in a good situation, it will it will slowly kill you physically and emotionally, not just emotionally, but physically. Like what I noticed is when I wasn't in a good environment with with I found they weren't bad guys. And later on we grew together and they changed, but in the moment they weren't the right ones. And I was physically dying faster. I, I mean, I was stressed. I was unhappy. And because there were so few resources, um, I, I was, it was physically affecting me. And what happens in this, the real, in the everyday world, again, because we have these, you know, the phones and distractions, food, uh, you know, toys, games, you know, we don't sometimes realize the situation we're in and what it's doing to us emotionally and, and even physically because we have distractions, but it's slowly eating away at us. So all I would say is, is to be more awake and aware of what's going on and not to be distracted, to try to be aware of, of what's going on in your everyday life and, and possibly change that situation, which will, you know, give you more life in, in, in so many aspects, you know? And so I, so just to echo on what you said about that, that was a big lesson I learned out there in the jungle. So. I love that too. And another, I want to echo off of that just to piggyback and, you know, I, we can be on here talking about this stuff for hours, but a big way to do that is to live in the now. Stop worrying about the future. Stop worrying about the past. When you find happiness and where you're going to find your peace is if you find it in the now. Um, and like I said, we actually have people commenting, please have Matt come back for, for a part two. So we're going to have to make sure that that happens. Uh, I would love this to. Amazing. Thanks, man. And, you know, we're going to make it happen. Um, so everybody watching, Please go follow Matt on his social media pages. You can follow him on Instagram, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, anything at Matt Jaskell. Um, and, and like I said, I, I'm just really happy and honored. And thank you so much for being so transparent to come on to share your story, to help everybody else um, with their personal lives. Because a lot of the things that you did mention, we go through in our own lives and it may not be behind the wheel, but it, it will be through the same shoes that we're wearing every day. And uh, when we walk out that door, there's a list of things that we want to accomplish and things that might happen that we can't foresee coming. But as long as we're falling forward and failing forward, that is really one of the keys that we've come to, uh, to make sure that it, it, we can live our lives that we want to accomplish and whatever dreams that we can do, we can accomplish it. So everybody again, to my I, positivity, what's again, up? Again, I, I, lo I love what you're doing here. And I just want to say really fast, thank you so much for letting me share my story and for those that listened and, and hopefully we'll, we'll see you again for part two. We'll share some more. Part two, let's get after it. Uh, Matt, stay after just a few minutes because I want to talk to you about something. But to my positivity posse, thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a great weekend. Stay safe. And we'll see you next week for another episode of Weekly Dose of Dano TV. Thank you again, Matt. Thank you to my positivity posse. Peace.